first service. <clears throat> yeah, David hasn't started preaching yet. He's, he'll put the pressure on in a few minutes. It's great to see everybody here today. We had uh, excellent attendance this morning at the first service, and it looks like we're going to have excellent attendance again at the 11 o'clock service. We want to thank everyone supporting our services here at the congregation through this COVID-19. I thought it might be COVID-29 or 39 by now, but it's still 19, so that's a good sign. That's a good sign. But uh, we've been very fortunate. Only one member of the congregation <clears throat> has contracted COVID-19, and he recovered. And it's a good sign. I think everybody must be behaving uh, outside the church building as well. But we appreciate your cooperation, wearing your mask, and uh, there's plenty of hand sanitizer around the building. So if you need some, it's, uh, it's everywhere. You won't have to look very far. But thank you all for being here this morning. Those of you downstairs in the fellowship room uh, worshiping with us, thank you. Uh, we want to welcome you. And remember, the, even though you're in the fellowship room, we're still here to worship. So let's worship. All of us worship together, even though we're separate. Uh, we have a few announcements to make this morning. The Orphan's Lifeline money is due Sunday, October 11th. Make sure you see Gina with that. Uh, the Walk for Water this year is being done remotely uh, between October 18th and 31st. Um, there are more details in the church bulletin. All the donations are due back by Sunday, November 1st. Please make your checks payable to Lincoln Park Church of Christ and put a note on the memo line that it's Walk for Water, or you can donate online. The Helping Hands ladies will begin meeting again. They will resume their monthly meetings uh, starting Monday, October 12th. Monday, October 12th. And uh, if you have any questions, you can see Linda Cost. That'll be 10 a.m. in the morning here at the building. We're trying to get back to some semblance of normalcy. So I think the ladies are looking forward to that. Linda, you make sure you all have masks on now when we get together. Okay, be careful. In our thoughts and prayers this morning, uh, Candy Lance spent some time in the hospital and uh, she is home recuperating. She was with us last Sunday morning. She's here this morning as well. Please keep Candy in your prayers. And uh, Sherry Bouchot spent some time in the hospital this past week. She has returned home and she's had some changes in her medications that will hopefully uh, handle the situation, the problem she's been having. Keep Sherry in your prayers. And please keep Wayne Davidson, the son of Martha Davidson, a brother of Mike, in your prayers. He's going through cancer treatment in Lebanon, Tennessee. Al Petrovich wants to say hello to everyone and thank, uh, thank the congregation for their phone calls and for their prayers. And uh, we're all very thankful that these people on the list are recuperating. And if you have the opportunity, send them a card, make a phone call, but let them know you're, you're, they're on your, uh, your mind and you're thinking about them and care about them. In sympathy, our brother Arlo, Arlo Seitz passed away on September 16th. Due to kidney failure, he was in Saginaw with his children, and his funeral was held Friday, September 25th at the Solacy Funeral Home in Lincoln Park. There is a uh, page uh, on the back bulletin board that gives a, a brief history of his life. There might be some information there that you weren't aware of, but uh, please keep the family of Brother Arlo Seitz in your prayers with their loss. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Good morning. Our first song as we enter worship service this morning is number 626. We will sing number 777 and then we will have our opening prayer. <clears throat> Christ for the world we sing. Christ for the world we sing. The world of Christ we bring with loving zeal. The poor and then the more. The faint and overborn sin, sick and sorrow, one who dies to heal. 
Right for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring with fervent prayer. The wayward and the lost by restless urgent of treaty and countless cause from the despair. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring with one accord with the world to share with us reproach to their with us the cross to bear for Christ the Lord. 77. Seven, seven, seven. Father, give a prayer we offer. No for see the prayer shall be but for strength that we are ever live our lives courageously for our time then our of weakness in our wandering be our guide through endeavor failure danger Father be our outside oh, oh. every thought of one shall be a shame may our soul in all our Thy word, thy ceaseless prayer. Amen. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to gather together. We thank you for giving us the day to worship you with. Father, we ask that you would comfort those who are fearful and confused in these times, that you would protect us, keep us safe. God, we ask that you would increase our understanding today through this sermon, that you would allow us to get from it what we can use to further your kingdom, God. Pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. In preparation for the Lord's Supper, we'll be singing number 922. 922, Jesus paid it all. <clears throat> I heard the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in thee, my all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to give my home. Sin has been a grandson stain. He washed it white as snow. 
Luke records three times that Jesus predicted his death. Two of them are in Luke 9, starting in verse 21. This is right after Jesus declared that, or sorry, Peter declared that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then in verse 43, now Jesus had been on the mountain of transfiguration and he came down and he healed a demon-possessed boy. And while everyone was marveling at all the works Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Then in chapter 18, after Jesus has done a lot of teaching, so a lot of parables, Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going on not to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and insult him and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. Finally, they got to Jerusalem, and that day came. In chapter 2, verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you because I suffer, before I suffer. <clears throat> For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until it finds fulfillment in, until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. you know, Jesus brought into the world the message of a selfless God. A God whom men were so dear that he bore their sins and their sorrows on his heart and he gave himself for them. Now up until Jesus came, the Jews, the world really, saw God as someone who was not interested really in men. He was 
or, the, or he was at least far off and unapproachable. But God proved through sending Jesus that he cares deeply about us. He's very interested in the affairs of men, of people, that he loves and cares for us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. Let's go to God in prayer for the bread. Father, we are so thankful for this bread that represents your son's body that hung, on, hung there on the cross, proving to us once for all how deeply you care for us, how much you want us to know you and to be in a relationship with you. Father, we are thankful for this bread. We pray that you'll bless it and bless those who partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue in prayer for the fruit of the vine. Father, we are so thankful for this fruit of the vine representing your son's precious blood that he shed on the cross for our sins. Father, we're thankful that he was willing to go through that and to show your love for us, that we might be saved. We thank you for, this, for his blood that washes our sins away and for this fruit of the vine representing that blood. We pray that you'll bless it and those who partake. In Jesus' name we pray. So thankful that we had an opportunity this morning to give uh, to the Lord as we came in the building. We pray that you took the opportunity to do that. It's, a, it's our way, you know, that God has commanded us to, to give back to him each, each week so that we can show our love for him. And we, we thank you for, you know, being faithful in, in that. Let's continue now in song. A song before the lesson is number 469, 469, <clears throat> Faith is the Victory. Will you please stand for this song? Encamped along the hills of life, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall fill the glory skies again. The full from them below, let off our heart will bear. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcome the world. His banner over us is love. How on the word of God. When yet the world, the saints have up with souls of triumph strong. By faith they lie, the world went wrong. Trapped over every field, the faith that which will conquer death is still a shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcome the world. To them that overcome so wide realm it shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in hell. Then onward from the hills of life our strength, the love of flame, will vanquish all the hopes of life in Jesus' God's name. 
Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. A glorious victory that overcome the world. Please be seated. A song of invitation will be number 129. Amazing grace. Thank you, Lewis. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So everybody been enjoying this beautiful weather we've had this past week? Good, because it's fall time. You know, with fall time, you never know what you're going to get, right? Flip a coin. Yeah, I was looking at the 10-day forecast. It's going to get a little chillier. But if you like bonfires and you like to sit around the fire, well, then this is your weather, right? This is your moment. It's your time. Hey, I forgot to mention it in the morning service, but I wanted to mention it now. So you know that we do the live stream, we record the live stream, we pop it up on YouTube for those who would like to, to re-listen to something or if uh, they, they weren't able to attend, uh, they, then they could go back and watch the service. Well, uh, Jim's son, uh, Blake, he's also doing it on SoundCloud, uh, so you can look up the Lincoln Park Church of Christ. And in next week's bulletin, I'm going to have Karen put a link for that where you can just uh, see, hear the audio copy of it. So if you have a smartphone, you can pull it up on there. And then you can listen to it as you're doing things throughout your day. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that before I forgot. But this morning we're here to talk about the Word of God. And we're here to, to uh, sing songs of praise to God and worship Him in spirit and truth, as I often say. If you look on the screen behind me, what does it say? Biblical faith brings victory. And we're here today to talk about that great victory that we have in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, it's important to understand that our victory in the Lord is complete. As I told the morning session, you don't have to, to hope to go to heaven. You don't have to say, man, I hope I get there. I wish to get there. I don't know. I've had a rough week. I don't know if I'm going to get there. You could know that uh, heaven's going to be your home. Yes, we still have to live faithfully. It's not like, uh, it's not like those uh, in other denominations teach that once saved, always saved. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is understanding that when you're born of God and you become a child of God, that you can have faith as the victory, not in what you do, but in what Christ has done. And so we're going to examine, if you want to open your Bibles this morning, 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. That's going to be the crux of the uh, lesson today. There's going to be one verse, verse 4, that we're going to look at multiple times. So you'll see it pop up on the slides multiple times, because there's really about three or four aspects of that one verse that we're going to look to identify this morning and to really look to have proper understanding of really all that John was teaching us. So remember that in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1 through 5, it says this, and I also have it on the screen behind me, for those of you who could see this a little bit smaller print. It says, For whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know the love that we by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Brother, that's the crux of our lesson here this morning. It's going to come from this passage of Scripture. And you have often heard me say that biblical faith is defined as belief and trust and obedience working in harmony together. It's not just belief, because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of people who just believe we're going to be condemned. Why? Because they don't live obediently. You see, it's belief, which then causes you to then, once you believe, you trust. And then once you trust in God and you trust in his promises that we're going to further explore here this morning, then you live obediently to God and his will, because you want to be found pleasing in his sight. You think about your children. We have many children here in the auditorium this morning. Parents, when your children aren't living obedient to the rules of the home, doesn't it just make for a great day? They're talking back. They're not doing what we ask them to do. We give them the simplest of tasks and they don't do it. But you say, ah, don't worry about it. No, you become irritated. You become a little angry, a little agitated. But because we know that, well, true uh, obedience would then follow through on the things they would ask you to do. Even if you don't necessarily agree with your parents' stance, because you're obedient to your parents and you love your parents, you do it anyways. You see, we as children of God need to understand that we obtain the victory not because of anything we do, 
but because everything that Jesus has done. For Jesus has, has, has conquered death. And we have complete uh, victory and salvation through Jesus' sacrifice. But then we as his children, for anybody who is born of God, as it says in verse 1, whoever believes in Jesus, but it's not just a belief, right? Then you have to be born of God. And whoever believes loves the Father. And so, brethren, as we get into this this morning, it's important to understand what true biblical faith is. And that's as I often say, it's belief, trust, and harmony working in, uh, in, in con uh, connection with one another, harmony with one another. But uh, when you think about faith, what about faith in general? Don't, hasn't the word faith just been completely watered down? I mean, think about how we use the word faith, and we use it in so many various uh, aspects of society, that the, the word faith is, more, is nothing more than just a, a verbal affirmation nowadays, a mental recognition that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, good for you. But if you don't believe, and then also trust, and then also be obedient, you're not going to have the victory, because you're not living obedient. You see, brethren, there is nothing that this world can do. There's no storms in this life. There's no pain or anger or a world uh, problems that could take your victory from you. But you could choose to give up your victory. You could choose to walk away from the victory that you have in Christ Jesus. And so this morning, this section of Scripture makes it crystal clear that real biblical faith is about trust and belief and obedience. And you see all that in, this, in these very five uh, verses in 1 John chapter 5. Brethren, if you wish to have the victory that overcomes the world, then you must allow the Bible to define what faith means. You can't allow uh, Webster's Dictionary to define faith. You can't allow the world to define faith. Only God gets to determine what biblical faith is. And so, brethren, if you wish to have that victory, you need to make sure that you conform to God's definition of faith and not the world's definition. There is an old story about a, a Christian man who was on his deathbed. And when he was dying, he shouted aloud the praises of God. He knew he only had a short time to live. He was in hospice. And he was waiting for that moment to where he was going to go to, go to the Father to, to, to receive his crown of life. And he was becoming a little boisterous, if you will. And his family members, his friends were saying, hey, just, just calm down. Save your strength. He said, just, just whisper. We'll, we'll get you what you need. He said, let the angels whisper. He says, if I could shout it from the North Pole to the South Pole. I would shout the victories that only come in Christ Jesus. Brethren, he says, my soul has been cleansed by the blood of Christ. My soul is redeemed from death and hell. He says, he says I stand on the threshold of eternal glory. As he was waiting to take his last breath. How many times when we think about our loved ones who have been in hospice, who have given their life to Christ, meaning that they're born of God, right? How many times do you really think that you stand on the precipice of eternal glory? That you're about to meet the maker, the creator, the one who's going to give you the crown of life, and you're going to have eternal glory. I wonder how many times those thoughts are going through your head. How many times when you go throughout the week, before we get too deep into this lesson, because we're going to talk a lot about the victory, and you're going to hear that word over and over. How often do you really think about God's promises? throughout your week. How often? I know we pray, and we'll come to Wednesday uh, Zoom uh, Bible study, and we'll come to, you know, worship service on Sunday, and, you know, we think about God, and we sing songs of praise to God, but how often do you really stop and really meditate on the promises that are made to us as God's children in the Scriptures? How often do you meditate on the fact that you if you're born of God, have victory that nothing in this world can take from you. You see, brethren, we need to focus more on the victory and focus less on the problems that we have in this life. And that man, he said, if I could shout from the, from the, from the, from the, from the highest hill, I would go up there and shout the praises of God because I have victory through the blood of the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, perhaps we ought to really stop and consider, before it's too late, our victory our hope, and our trust in the very promises of God. So let's spend some time here this morning. The crux of this lesson is in 1 John chapter 5, but it's really verse 4. 
And so if you look on the screen behind me, notice again one more time what it says. Because there's, a very, there's about three or four different parts of that one little verse that we're going to break down here this morning. Notice once again, it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. When you look at that one word that is contained in that verse, it's overcome. The overcome means to conquer. It means to prevail. It means to triumph, thus overcome. Well, triumph over what? Over the world. And we're going to look to define in context what is John talking about by overcoming the world. Did you know that that word overcome is used 28 times in the New Testament in 24 verses? We overcome despite the presence of war and conflict in the world. We overcome despite social and ethnic unrest. We, we overcome despite worldwide pandemics and marriage problems and children problems and financial problems and health problems. You see, we overcome despite what the world throws at us because we realize who we are in Christ Jesus. To overcome implies an obstacle or a barrier. So what is the obstacle or barrier? It's the world. You know, three times in the passage of 1 John chapter 5, we see that thing, the idea that the text says that we need to overcome the world. Well, what is, he to, what is John referring to when he speaks of the world? Well, first and foremost, he's speaking of Satan, because Satan is the god of this world. And Satan longs to get us to be divided. Satan looks to, uh, to distort the truth. He's trying to, to uh, cause division within the Lord's church. And he's done a heck of a job because there's thousands of variations of Christianity. And so many individuals, they'll come to one congregation of, 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 a, of a denomination or even the Lord's church, and they'll hear a, 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 the gospel preached, and they'll say, that doesn't really align with my belief system and with how I wish to live, and so I'm going to go to the next church down the street. I'm going to go check out the Baptist. And I go to the Baptist, and, you know, it sounded pretty good, but, you know, even they had some things I well, really wasn't uh, happy with, so I'm going to go check out the Methodist church, and then I'm going to check out the Lutheran church, and then I'm going to check out the Pentecostal church, and eventually I'm going to find somebody who's going to want to tell me what I want to hear. You see, brethren, that is the devil working in the world to confuse us and to make us to believe that it's more important about what I feel because truth isn't based on God. Truth is subjective. You see, because, well, Lewis's truth might be different than Jacob's truth. That might be different than Diane's truth. Why? Because they all lived different lives and they have different life experiences. And so they can all feel, because the world tells them, that truth is derived from your experiences in this life. And that it's really, truly subjective. And that you can't know truth. And shame on us for trying to force our truth on somebody else. Have you guys heard that? You see, that's being taught all the time. And so we need to understand that we can know truth. And so when the Bible in the text of 1 John chapter 5 talks about overcoming the world, it's, this is part of the idea of overcoming. We also, it also refers to overcoming uh, the world in, in regards to sin and suffering and pain and all opposition to God. Is there a lot of opposition to our God when it comes to our government? You know, a country that was once founded on Judeo-Christian principles is now fully in opposition, not fully, but getting there to be fully in opposition to the Word of God, trying to remove all aspects of God from society. And so, brethren, the devil's doing a good job. So when in 1 John, when it says overcoming the world, that is part of what it's talking about. The world tries to destroy and to distort the truth. It tries to distort true and honest and good desires. It dilutes man's interest in doing good by beating us down and thinking that there's no such thing as a good person anymore and that everybody's sinful and everybody's evil, so why even try to do good? And so it tries to beat us down, and we need to make sure that we don't allow it to beat us down. And also, to the world, brethren, longs to confuse Christians' core values. It longs to tell you that you can't know the truth, and there's no such thing as absolute truth. Because, well, it's truly subjective. The world tries to overcome your faith by, by fitting you into a mold. A mold that they get to dictate what and how it looks like and what it sounds like. So, brethren, what are you going to do? Are you going to give up your victory 
by being allowing yourself to be crammed into the mold that the world dictates what's acceptable and what's true and what's right? Or are you going to stick to the word of God even if you lose friends? Are you willing to lose friends for the word of God? Are you willing to lose family members for the word of God? To stand on the truth of God's word. Why? To obtain the victory, not because of what you do, but because of what Christ has already done for you. You see, there's nothing that you do that brings the victory. It's what Christ has done that brings the victory. And it's so crucial that we understand that we don't allow the world to fit us into its mold, but we try to bring the world into the mold that God has made. And so, brethren, never forget Romans chapter 12 and verse, one, uh, verse 2. It says, and do not overcome, it says, and do not be overcome by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove that what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so never forget Romans chapter 2. We don't allow the world to, uh, to mold us. We try to bring those in the world and allow them to be influenced by God's truth. If they wish to obtain the victory, the world strives to get us to forget who we are. And the world has succeeded in, 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 in getting people to forget who they are and whose they are. I can't tell you how many people have left the Lord's Church only to go join some other denomination where they know they're teaching truth. They even admit that they understand not everything they teach is true, and yet they go anyways. Why? Because they've been overcome by the world. You see, because it's not about the truth and standing firm and contending for the faith, like Jude tells us in Jude's short letter, that we need to contend for the faith, means we need to fight for the faith, not a physical fight, but a spiritual fight, where we stand firm in the word of God. Are you willing to contend for the faith, to obtain the victory? Brothers and sisters, the, word strive, the world strives to get us to forget who we are. And in the world, we are surrounded by problems daily, but we must not be discouraged. Why? Because it goes back to faith is the victory. For all individuals who are born of God must look towards the promise. And that's why I asked you earlier, how often do you dwell on the promises of God? Do you meditate on the promises of God, or do you just meditate on how bad my life has been lately? How many problems there are? The civil and the social unrest in this country, is that all you meditate on? You see, because it's easy to get caught up in, the, in, in, in all the negativity that's in the media, that's portrayed on all the various websites, all the various news stations, all the channels, all the podcasts, all the blogs. Brethren, you need to uh, focus on the promises and the victory and not all the problems that try to get you to lose your victory. And so it all comes, it all comes back to understanding who you are. Brethren, we are at war. It's a spiritual war, but we do not have to lose. For greater is he who is in us than is in the world. Have you heard that before? Greater is, is, is he who is in us. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? You can say yes. You can say I believe it. I would hope that you would want to shout it from the rooftops. That Jesus Christ is my Savior. And that I have victory through Jesus Christ. Brethren, we think about this. Also, I want you to think about uh, another illustration. Another illustration was this painter. A painter was painting this uh, painting that, dict uh, that, that, uh, 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 that, that pictured the devil playing chess. The devil was playing chess with this young man. And this young man, uh, had his, has his, he, literally his eternal soul was at stake. And the devil uh, uh, was perceived in this painting to make a move that he thought he was going to get a checkmate on this young man. And the young man had this look of despair on his face. But there's this other man who came by this art gallery, and he's seen this, and he's a world-famous chess player. And the great chess player came across this work of art, and after carefully studying the game, taking a picture of it, he takes it back home, he sets up a chess board, and he looks at the pieces, and after much thought, and after much time, he saw that defeat could be actually turned into victory. What appeared to be defeat could be turned into victory by making just one move on behalf of that young man. So what's the point? Brethren, there are times when it may seem that as if we are defeated. There are going to be times in this life when it may seem like you are defeated, but remember that those who put their trust and their obedience in Christ Jesus have a complete victory. We don't have a partial victory. You don't have to say on Monday, man, I'm in. And on Wednesday, it's been a couple, 
tough couple, tough couple days. I don't know if I'm making it. And you're in and you're out and you're wishy and you're washy and you don't know if you're going to heaven or going to hell. I've heard so many people in the Lord's church make these statements that they don't know if they're in or out. Rather, in 1 John in chapter 5 and about verse 13 or 17, it tells us that you can know that you are saved. He says, he literally says, I am writing these things so you can know that you are saved. So you can know you have the victory. And so a great, when you think about uh, uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, notice what it also tells us. If God is for us, who could be against us? If God is for you, what could be against us? You see, there's nothing. Winston Churchill once said, victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all the terror. Victory for victory, no matter how long or how hard the road may be, for, for, for without victory, there is no survival. You think about that phrase and, or that quote that Winston Churchill made, and you think about it now from a, that's a physical sense, but think about it from a spiritual sense. You see, victory brings eternal life. Defeat brings eternal condemnation. And so you can look at Winston Churchill's quote and notice that it has a spiritual application as well. Because you can live a good moral life, can you not? And yet be outside the church. You can do good things and treat people with kindness and respect. And still not attain the victory. Because if you go back to 1 John chapter 5, and verse 1 through 5, it, says, it talks about those who are born of God. Whatever is born of God. And so it's important that we understand. Brethren, just like the long says, I am not concerned, just like the song says. I am not concerned about the way it's all going to end because I've already read the book and I know the end of the story. Once again, you look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 behind me and we look at it from a different aspect this time. Before we were looking at it from the idea of becoming an overcomer and what it means to overcome the world. And now you look at 1 John 5 and 4 and once again, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. But notice in this verse, it also talks about the provision. John talks about God's provision for all who are born of God. You know, during a successful revival, there was a man in a, a certain town, and he was, a, he was a notorious drunk. He gave his life to Christ, though, after hearing the gospel message. And he would attend church from time to time, but he was a notorious drunk. He wasn't uh, well-respected within his community because of what his drunkenness had caused him to do. And, and the things and the people that, that, he, that he hung out with. And so he decides to go to this revival. He hears the, the true unadulterated word of God and he makes a commitment to Jesus Christ. And he gives his life to Christ. And he strove to live a life that was sober and respectable in everybody's sight. But the story also tells of the owner of a bar. And this owner of this bar became angry because he lost one of his favorite customers, one of his best customers. And he would see John walking by the bar and just keep on going. And one day he went outside and he said, hey, John, what's gone wrong? Why aren't you coming in? Come on in. Have a good time, man. Throw a couple back. Tell a few jokes. Play some pool. Throw some darts. What is going on? And John said, he says, brother, he said, I've looked to come, he goes, I, for, he says, for years I've been walking by this bar, and I've prayed for strength, and I've hoped for the strength to just keep on going, and he says, I've never had the strength to be able to pass it by. He says, but, he goes, I went to this revival, and I made Jesus the Lord of my life, and I made a commitment to Jesus, that I was going to live for him and not the God of this world. I was going to live for him and not my desires and wants, and he says, and so I he goes, I think that we need to just keep on going. We need to keep on walking, and we need to get on by this place. And he says, what is all this we talk that you're talking about? And he simply said, he said, when I became a Christian, I realized that I wasn't strong enough before to walk by this bar without coming in. He says, but now I don't walk alone anymore because I made Jesus the Lord of my life, and I have yoked myself to Christ. Who here knows what a yoke is? You know, a yoke is that thing that you put over the, uh, over the necks of two bull or ox or whatever you want to call it, and then they pull in tandem. And so it's not just one bull pulling. No, it's two bulls because two bulls are stronger than one bull. And brethren, I'm here to tell you that when you were baptized, who did you receive to dwell inside you? Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit God? And so the Holy Spirit of God dwells within you, and you walk side by side with the Holy Spirit. So on the days of your, of your darkest days, 
You're the biggest temptations. You don't walk alone. The Bible says for every temptation, God provides an outlet if only you look for it. And so, brethren, you need to understand that you can have victory in the midst of the storm. And you don't walk alone. It's when, when we think we walk alone is when we fail and when we give in and when we sin and when we allow the world to start to overcome our faith. So, brethren, it's about understanding who you are and it's about understanding that these struggles in life are not going away. And you in, in and of yourself are not strong enough. You are not strong enough to deal with them on your, on your own. But you don't have to deal with them on your own because Jesus walks side by side with you, hand in hand with you through this thing called life. All he once understood as he wrote the, his letters to the Romans, he understood the struggle that we human beings face on a regular basis when it comes to sin. You remember in Romans chapter 3 when it says, there is none righteous, not even one? That's an Old Testament passage that he's reflecting upon because he says God looks out over the nation of Israel. He says, there is not one that are righteous. And in Romans 3 and 23, the Apostle Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of, the, uh, of God's righteousness. For if we have all sinned and fallen short, then we realize that we are not strong enough on our own. And we need Jesus to be our guide. And then you look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. And it says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from that body of this death? From the body of this death. Well, there's an interesting, uh, a lot of your commentators believe that, that Paul, when he wrote this, he was talking about one particular thing. In ancient times, when, when nations would conquer other nations, or some tribal groups would conquer other tribal groups, because when we look at it, we think, we think of nations, but really they were tribal type peoples, right? Small factions of people. And one would conquer another, and they would keep the best of society, but kill everybody else. But they didn't have anywhere to really put the prisoners, because they didn't have the fortresses and the compounds, like what we think of today. And so they would tie the dead bodies of the ones they killed to the backs of the ones they wanted to keep, talking about their prisoners. So a lot of your commentators believe when Paul wrote this, it actually meant to say, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this dead body? Who shall deliver me from this dead body? Talking about the body of death. You see, Paul understood our struggles. And just a few verses later, we go from chapter 7 to chapter 8, and it says in Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirits. Brethren, there is a remedy to the obstacles that we face in this world. Are you ready to see it? There is a remedy that we face in this obstacle, that is the obstacles of this world. Romans, or Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 tells us, it says, therefore Jesus, Jesus is also able to save partially those who draw near to God through him, since he has always lived to make intercession for his creation. Did you notice the word I used? I said partially. Is that what it says? It says Jesus is also able to save completely. Not based on you, but based on what he came and what he accomplished and what he did. So brethren, you can have victory, and it is a complete victory. And we need to understand that Jesus tells us in the Gospels that no one comes unto the Father except through him. There are many Bible passages that reveal, that reveal the victory that all people, all people can overcome the obstacles of this world when they draw near to Christ and when they clothe themselves with Christ through Christian baptism. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57, it says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. You didn't obtain the victory. The victory was obtained by Christ Jesus. Again, John, 1 John 5 and 4. For whatever is born, don't, let, don't skip past that word born. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. You guys remember uh, Dwight Eisenhower? Dwight Eisenhower once said, there are no victories at discounted prices. Brethren, that is so true. One of the songs that, G, uh, or that Lewis sang tonight is Jesus Paid It All. And so as he's saying this morning, Jesus paid it all, Jesus paid the ultimate price. Why? So we might have the victory. Note again in 1 John 5 and 4, for whatever is born of the world overcomes the world. And we should note the emphasis there in that verse. This text does not say he that overcomes but rather whatever is born of God. It doesn't say he that overcomes, but you haven't overcome anything. Jesus overcame the world. Jesus had victory over death. 
And one commentator stated that overcoming here is non-personalized on purpose to make a point. It's never the man that overcomes, but it's his birth from God and that which brings and that which it brings into his life that has overcome the world. And so, brothers and sisters, it is not a man who overcomes, rather it is Christ Jesus. And we have our victory in him and because of him. An individual in the world can live a good moral life, as I said earlier. You can treat people with respect. You could go around doing good, and you can live a, a respectable life, stay out of trouble, not, you know, not committing crimes, you know, uh, and just be a good person. And guess what? It's not good enough. It's not good enough because you won't attain the victory. Because what have I said over and over? And what did that verse say? Whatever is born of God. How are you born of God? Baptism. So, brethren, if you're not born of God here this morning, I want you to really focus in on this this morning because you, you haven't obtained the victory. You may be learning, you may be growing, but if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then why not act on that faith? You see, brethren, because right now you're still outside of that victory. You haven't obtained the victory because there's no amount of good things you could do to bring about that victory. Only Jesus could bring that victory. So if you do not come to Jesus confessing your faith, being baptized, and seeking to live faithful, then in the end you will lose. And I, the last part of uh, 1 John in chapter 5 and verse 4 that I want to look at this morning, once again, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, brethren, our faith. What, is the, what overcomes? Our faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is more than a verbal affirmation that I believe that he's the Son of God. The word faith has been so watered down, as I said at the beginning of the lesson, by current society and our current vernacular that we use the word faith in so many different aspects that nobody really even understands what true biblical faith means anymore. In too many people, in too many cases, faith is not much more than a mental acceptance of who Jesus is. But that alone, that alone brethren, won't save anybody. And so the context of this passage stresses obedience. John often equates keeping the commandments of God to loving God and having faith in Jesus Christ. And so as I close this lesson down, who here is born of God? If you have been born of God, praise God for you, are, you have the victory. If you continue to love God and to live faithfully, you will receive the crown of life. There is nothing in this world that can take that victory from you. But brothers and sisters, the faith, meaning belief of John, John speaks as a faith that, that, that reacts in obedience. See, just hearing the word is not good enough. Faith comes from hearing, yes. But then you have to actually believe, then you have to trust in those promises, and then you have to act upon that faith. And so as I close this down and we offer the, offer of, we offer the invitation, the closing question I have for those who have not given their life for Christ is, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you have an opportunity right now to make Jesus the Lord of your life, to enter into Jesus' victory, to have your sins washed away. Brethren, there's no other way to get in the church than through Christ Jesus, for no one comes unto the Father except through him. You have an opportunity right now, as Lewis stands and sings, Song of Invitation. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I seem was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my till relief for precious dim that grace of fear. Be I first believe when we bend their ten thousand years 
Again, we'd like to say, say that we're so happy to have you here the second service. Those who are downstairs, we can't see you, but we still believe you're there. Steve will lead us in our word of prayer, and we pray that we will be ready this Wednesday to come together again to study another portion of God's word. Shall we bow? And your gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you so thankful for this beautiful day that you've given to us. Father, we're mindful of those of this congregation that are suffering, and we ask, Father, that you'll be with them and touch them and heal them. Be with those that are administering to them. Help them to make the right decisions and give them the proper treatments. Father, we're, we ask that you be with the elders of this congregation as they continue to guide us. Give them strength and wisdom. Father, we ask that you be with our nation. Help us through this time of trouble and this. Help us to go through this virus. Help the scientists and the doctors to come up with the treatment. Continue to bless us, Father. Be with the missionaries around the world as they continue to preach your word. Be with us each day as we have the opportunity to preach, to teach, and to be an example of your son. Help us to touch someone each day in our, in our daily lives, to bring them closer to you. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen.